This is the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Podcast, Episode 13, Managing Cover Crops as Part of Your Cropping System. Advice from Experts. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Today, we'll hear from three different experts and their view of cover crops. We'll start with Barry Fisher. He's with the United States Department of Agriculture and a soil health specialist for Indiana. Basically, uh, laying out some foundational principles to improve soil health and to improve, improve soil function. And then followed up with that is, is uh, basically management principles that, that help, help producers trying to improve soil health and soil function from a management standpoint, what are some, some baselines that they need to stop, start from. So start with the foundational principles. What might they be? Well, from a soil health standpoint, if we look across all agriculture enterprises, uh, we find that if we can reduce the soil disturbance, if we can keep the soil covered, if we can add some diversity of plant life, that, that gives us diverse food sources for the organisms in the soil. And then if we can find a way, if, since we're feeding the organisms in the soil from the plants, then we need those plants growing. We need living roots longer than just our our, our summertime uh, crops. So therein lies, that's why cover crops fit into to a lot of those four key principles. Cover crops play a good role. And so what kinds of things would they promote in the soil itself? Well, uh, the cover crop, because it, it has the ability after the rest of our crops senesce and go into dormancy and, or, and get harvested, there's still a lot of days of sunlight left, of free sunlight energy, that that cover crop can grab that sunlight energy, grabs carbon out of the atmosphere, build sugars, build proteins, build build food essentially and those actually come out the roots those are come out as exudates into the root into the soil and that's the food stuff for many of the really important organisms the mycorrhizal fungi the important bacteria the you know there's even beneficial nematodes there's there's a lot of living things in the soil that really help us provide pore space and and nutrient cycling in our soil so if we can feed those organisms using that free sunlight energy that we otherwise are not capturing uh, in the late fall and, and into the early earlier spring before we plant, those we've got those two windows that gives us a lot of extra feeding potential for the or- beneficial organisms in the soil. So the living earth then gives back to the crop the next season? Sure, it's all part of nutrient cycling. It keeps all of our nutrients, that's what a lot of our conference is about, keep the nutrients on the land, keep them in play. If we can keep those nutrients when the crops aren't using it, if they can be assimilated into other living things that are going to cycle them back to the crop the next year, then that's a win for everybody. While those organisms are living and assimilating those nutrients, keeping those nutrients on the farm, they're also moving around in the soil. They're producing glues that aggregate the soil, that provide pore space. That allows better infiltration. That allows better water holding capacity of the soil and more plant available water and more plant available nutrients for a longer period of time into the summer. So it's, it's all about improving real soil function. You know, when we talk about soil health, it's not just something to make us feel good. We're talking about real improvements to soil functions that relate immediately back to productivity potential, resilience during tough weather times and 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 major major economic uh, efficiencies in our in our agricultural systems what are the management practices that you talk about well when we talk about management we want to reduce tillage okay uh, if we can reduce the tillage either adopt some strip till or, or no till uh, that takes a lot of the disturbance the physical disturbance out of the soil okay uh, and, and then we, we look at nutrient management. We time it. We place nutrients less, you know, in more of a, a spoon feeding process. That actually takes some of the, the chemical disturbance shock out of the system. When we put a whole bunch of nutrients at one time, that's kind of a shock to the system. So that's a management practice that's actually beneficial if we, if we spread that application out in a more timely fashion. It's actually beneficial to the organisms too and the soil function. But then we talk about adding the cover crops, managing that cover crop. And we may manage a different cover crop differently depending on what's the next crop in our crop rotation. So understanding of conservation crop rotation 
is also a practice. I mean, and, and so we talk about those, those type things all bundling into a management system that those practices then are working synergistically toward an overall benefit to the soil function and soil health. When you talk about the nutrients that are applied, generally speaking, the source of in would be the primary uh, and largest uh, applications that are made. Are you concerned about the other nutrients and how do you deal with in and spreading that out over a larger time frame? Well, certainly in, but, but phosphorus is a big one too for us, see? So as we look at this system, one thing that we do know is as we increase the ecosystem, it increase the biological populations in the soil, there's natural enzymes that are produced that actually release more uh, phosphorus from the soil, the mineral part of the soil. It detaches it, makes it more plant available. So we have to look at that and then decide, okay, should we alter our phosphorus management to this to match this system and the timing of its release? So, you know, we start changing, you know, our nutrient management plan we still focus on the four R's, but those four R's may change as we change the carbon cycle and change the, 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 you know, some of those. Nitrogen the same way. If we can get a nitrogen management so that, so that uh, when we're spoon feeding and we get those organisms in the soil, you know, bacteria is very high in nitrogen. You know, so we've got a good bacteria cycling and, and, and some of the organisms that are in there cycling, they're making a uh, a more stabilized source of nitrogen in the soil that it actually gets released in the summertime during maximum uptake. So it provides kind of a, uh, a, a, a good nutrient and nitrogen management tool, just the biology itself does if we know how to manage that. One final question, the four R's stand for what? Right rate, right time, right source, and right place. Thanks so much, Barry. All right, thanks. Barry Fisher is a soil health specialist with the United States Department of Agriculture. He's based in Indiana. Eileen Kludubko is also in Indiana, but at Purdue University, where she serves as an agronomist and looks into cover crops. I asked her about her experience with them. So cover crops generally um, are a very good tool for improving soil health um, by improving aggregation of the soil or the tilth of the soil, the friability of the soil. Um, allowing water to infiltrate into the soil easier, um, for roots to grow better in the soil, um, for better aeration, water holding capacity, nutrient recycling. If you don't have a problem with soil tilth, and there will be a lot of soils in Illinois, maybe Indiana as well, that don't have that kind of a problem, does it matter very much? I guess I would argue that, that um, <clears throat> although people think they don't have a problem, their soil actually isn't as good as it could be. Um, we actually have a lot of crusting on soils, even though they might be high organic matter soil. And so improved aggregation and friability and rooting at the surface can then allow for better water infiltration and better aeration and better nutrient cycling uh, within that soil. So even though people might think they don't have a problem, it's not as good as it could be. How much of the soil profile are we talking about here? Cover crops will really affect the top couple of inches, but, but their effects can actually go down a couple of feet because their roots are going to be going that deep. And how quickly is the effect? For some effects, you can see something already within the first year. The improvement in the friability and tilt of the surface happens with a good cover crop growth the first time you grow it. Can you give me a couple of definitions first for tilth? Yes, tilth... Tilth is that quality of the soil related to how it feels and how it breaks apart and will roots be able to grow through it and is it the kind of soil you would like in your garden that you could kind of crumble apart easily so um, organisms can get in and out of the soil, earthworms can grow in the soil, your roots can grow. And friability, give me that definition. Friability is how easy it is to break the soil apart, to crumble the soil in your hands. So if the soil is in a moist condition and you can easily crumble it, that would be a friability. And why are these things good for crops? Those types of things help crops because it helps the crop 
roots, first of all, grow, and secondly, function and take nutrients up. So the plant is not going to grow very well if it can't extract nutrients from the soil, and improved friability helps with that. Turn your attention to water quality and uh, yeah. the impact that a cover crop might have there. Cover crops are very effective in scavenging or trapping nutrients that are in the soil that would otherwise uh, be lost when we don't have a crop growing. So, for example, in much of Illinois and Indiana, we have a lot of water that flows through the soil in the, in the winter into tile drains, and they carry nutrients like nitrate um, when there's no plant there to take them up. If you have a cover crop there to take it up, it will pick up that nitrate and keep it from getting into the tile drainage water and then recycle those nutrients in subsequent years for use by your cash crop. How efficiently? How efficiently do they work? Um, they're very efficient. They'll cut the losses by about half quite often. Now you don't get to use all those nutrients immediately. It's kind of like putting money into the bank, but in a CD, not into an account that you can extract right away. And that's part of our challenge is, is talking about we're saving these nutrients, we're building our bank account, but we don't get to withdraw it all right away. Over what kind of time frame are we talking? Probably five to ten years, which is the challenge that cover crops are uh, long-term investment, and they're not generally going to pay a return um, over the short term. Do we have that depth of research yet to understand what that return really looks like? There's a lot of research going on, um, but the timing of when it's released is very complicated, of course, uh, based on what the weather is, based on how much cover crop growth you had, based on exactly what your crop rotation is, what your soil type is. So there is a lot of work going on right now, but we can't provide people with a very definitive answer on your soil. You're going to start getting that back in four years or six years or seven years. We don't, we don't know that yet. Are there best management practices for the use of a cover crop, and are they regionalized? Yes, there are best management practices uh, for the use of a cover crop. Um, they're somewhat regionalized in the sense of um, where we have uh, different different climate. We know that you know when you're further north, you're going to have different different uh, concerns and and different practices than when you're further south. So, yes, there's a lot of Advice, there's a lot of good advice available from um, NRCS and Extension in our, in our different states. Can you give me some of those BMPs? Well, one would be to, to grow something like a cereal rye before soybeans, which fix their own nitrogen. Um, and when you're first starting out, don't plant cereal rye before corn because there's the potential to tie up nitrogen. Um, if you do plant cereal rye then you want before corn, then you want to terminate it early and you want to use starter nitrogen so that the corn crop is not um, hurting for nitrogen early in the season. You don't change your overall nitrogen rate. You just front end load the nitrogen a little bit earlier so that the corn crop can get at it. Corn is the problem in the rotation that includes uh, a cover crop. However, I think that's related to how early it's put somewhat to how early it's planted. With the earlier planting dates for soybeans, do you anticipate that there will be a problem there at some point as well? No, because it's a, it's a different problem. The, the main problem is the nitrogen tie-up uh, that the cover crop has uh, before corn. Before soybeans, you don't have that issue because soybeans fix their own nitrogen, of course. So even with earlier planting dates, I think we're fine with soybeans. Eileen Kladuvko is a Purdue University agronomist. Lowell Gentry is a principal research specialist at the University of Illinois in the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences. He's been studying the way nitrates move through the soil profile and into the river system for quite some time. I asked him about application rates and timing and how he gets farmers to think about those particular ideas as they relate to their management systems. Yes, we've been looking at uh, timing of nitrogen applications. So we're looking at uh, fall nitrogen fertilization versus spring nitrogen fertilization. And uh, what we've found over the last three years is that we're only losing 5% of what we put on. So we're losing about 8 pounds per acre more with fall in than spring in, and we're putting 160 on. So that's 5% of the fertilizer that's being lost, but that is more than 30% of the tile load. And so uh, we might be losing uh, 
24 pounds per acre, but eight of that came from fall end. So that's, that's where that 30% comes from. So something for producers to keep in mind as they move forward into their growing seasons year after year. The other thing that they'll be interested in is your topic for the day here at the Cover Crops Conference and what kinds of things you've been able in your research to discover as it's related to using these in a crop rotation for grain. We've had really good luck with cereal rye after corn ahead of soybean. And uh, in a warm winter, and we had two of them, 2016 and 2017, we had very good establishment and good growth of the cover crop. And uh, that reduced the tile nitrate load by 40%. And uh, there was even a beneficial carryover to the next drainage season. So uh, we were very pleased with uh, that kind of performance. And uh, it did not affect the soybean yields. Um, and so... Uh, uh, we're, we're pleased with that, but we're not sure what we should put in front of corn now uh, after soybean. We know there's quite a bit of nitrogen lost to a tile just from mineralization uh, following soybean. You've got that low C-den ratio material, and uh, nitrate is nitrate. It doesn't matter if it came from organic matter or from fertilizer. It can leach. So uh, we need something in the rotation, I believe, after soybean. And so this year we've tried annual ryegrass and radish ahead of corn. And uh, it doesn't look very good right now as far as uh, these cold temperatures. It looks pretty dead. We're, we're hoping it comes back. Where the cereal rye is hardy and it, it looks better. But uh, we're worried about cereal rye in front of corn. You have to kill it so early to make sure that there's uh, uh, not a yield drag um, and uh, we're killing it so early then we don't get the benefit to the tile. So uh, uh, we're, we're also uh, interested in trying wheat as a cover crop ahead of corn and, uh, and, and killing it with Roundup before we plant corn just like we would any other cover crop. And we might try that if, if this annual ryegrass fails this year. So annual ryegrass at this point is what you think is the best option for producers who want to try this? What other kinds of things might they consider? And this, of course, will happen in the fall of 2019. Right. Um, I have not tried uh, as many uh, different cover crops as, as I would, of course, like to. We're limited by space in these studies. And I'm sure today at this conference we'll, we'll hear some other ideas. But I hear folks uh, talk about triticale and also a winter barley. But then I hear downsize, uh, downside to both of them, uh, that the triticalia forms so much root mass that it, that, uh, it might negatively impact corn. And then uh, um, I heard recently that the uh, winter barley uh, may not overwinter very well, especially like this last year. So we, just, we like cereal rye at this point because it's just so winter hardy. And we've tried oat and radish. So we've tried things that winter kill in front of corn and uh, we need that benefit of the spring growth so the the oat and radish that winter killed had no effect on the tile nitrate you know it provided some cover but it 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 didn't uh, take up enough soil and to reduce the tile load what are your best set of advice for putting this uh, cereal rye in place in the fall we have tried both uh, seeding into standing corn and also waiting till corn is harvested so we can drill and clearly drilling is the most reliable. Uh, but if, if you knew there was a rain coming and, and you had it set up and you could fly it on right before rain, then you can get good establishment. But it's all about uh, soil moisture if, if you're flying it on. And uh, it's been hit and miss, and, and you hate to see a failure. So, uh, but when it did fail, when we flew it on, then we drilled it. Uh, but that's added cost. But from an experiment standpoint, we wanted a cover crop, you see. So... Uh, I think drilling it after harvest is, is the most reliable way of doing it. That's Lowell Gentry from the University of Illinois. We also talked today on the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Podcast with Eileen Kladubko from Purdue University and Barry Fisher from USDA. He serves as a soil health specialist in Indiana. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason.